Hey, what's up everybody? I'm Fatim. And I'm Aja. And we're Kindred the, the Family, Family Soul. Soul. And we're here to talk about our new show, Kindred Presents. Well, you've been through so we're grateful to have tonight yes, Mr. Michael Eric Dyson. No. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Carl Thomas. Miss Angela, Angela Rye. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mr. Music Soul Child. Child. Give it up for Habit of My Beat, Miss Jill Scott. Ladies and gentlemen, Zoe and Carmen Rogers. The incomparable Mr. Kenny, Kenny Lattimore. Lattimore. Ladies and gentlemen, CC Pittis. Y'all give it up for Lomo. A round of applause for Dr. Umar, Umar Johnson. Johnson. Y'all give it up again for David Banner. This right here feels good. Well, how we got to the idea of Kendra Presents is that we were toying around with the idea of doing a radio show for a long time, but playing the kinds of music that we like and that we enjoy and that our audience likes and enjoys. This was our opportunity to give artists like ourselves the opportunity to be on something that resembled like a late night talk show. Tell us about your experience with Def Jam. Is that right? You had two minutes and it just threw me out there. Why do you call <laughs> black people trifling? For a mother or father to invest so much in how the child looks as opposed to where they will be in 20 years is trifling. Have you thought about just not doing music anymore? Yeah, <laughs> we think about that a lot. We knew that people really wanted to get into a conversation and in the same room with artists who they like their entire body of work. Come on, if I come all disrespectful, oh, my convo is a little bit too sexual. Damn, it's incredible, be more flexible, cause the context of the set is special. Oh, oh, but wait. I just wanna get back to love, back to love. It's coming up on like the one year anniversary of doing Kendrick Presents. We've done like 34 shows. We've had like a hundred guests on the show so far. We've learned so much during the journey, learned so much from the artists and influencers who have participated in the show. We're so excited to be able to get this opportunity to sit back and recap the experience. Oh yes. You ready, babe? I'm ready. Let's take it back. I usually sport my, I don't have no gators on tonight. You know what I'm saying? Pink Gators, my Detroit players, Tim's foot, okay. Michael Eric Dyson was going to be a, a guest on the show and we reached out to him. I'm not, I don't remember how we actually got, we met him out in LA, I believe, right? Well, we, we saw him again out in, in Los Angeles. We were doing this um, festival and Michael Eric Dyson was there and he was texting me and telling me that he was out in the audience and that, you know, we brought him back to the backstage. And so that's where we actually initially initiated the conversation about him coming onto the show again. But I have been reaching out to Mike for a while, like trying to get him, you know, to come on the show. I was like texting him, uh, texting him and, and hitting him on Twitter and his DMs and all those different <laughs> things, like I do to all of these different people. We basically and harass people. We, ha we had to harass them in until the we fun, Until we run into them, like professionally. <laughs> It's like, now you know I've been harassing you, right? right. Like, when you coming on the show? It's great to be here with my favorite contemporary soul music group in America. There you go. I'm just saying. To have Michael Eric Dyson and all of the esteem that comes with being who he is refer to us as his best contemporary soul group in America, I mean, come on. Like, who doesn't want that? Um, validation in whatever way of somebody of that caliber giving you that kind of love in front of your own audience as well, but just in general, like it was really, really um, And let's face it, you know that he listens to lyrics. Yes. I'm unashamedly and unapologetically rooted in and deeply entrenched in the blackness that birthed me. I remember I called up a three or four black schools because I was poor with my child trying to get my paper right. And they said, Negro, we don't know you. Who are you? Now that I'm quote known, Right? They might have a different disposition. And I love those institutions. I love those schools. But somebody got to tell white folk the truth in the midst of white culture as well. Now, I get a lot of hate mail from white people. You nigger. You horrible nigger. All I want now is please call me Dr. Nigger. Can you just address me as Dr. Nigger, right? Yeah. Like, uh, can you please call me Dr. Nigger? Can I get my Dr. Title? Nigger, though? Please? No, Dr. Nigger. <laughs> with the ER on it. With the ER. Wow. No, I mean, we started having that conversation because my thing was, this guy has so much to offer, 
why not work at an HBCU? Right. Because he had taught, you know, at a lot of predominantly white institutions. Right. I love black institutions. I started there. But it would be, I would be lying to say that those black institutions have not reached out to me, some of them because they're conservative. Some of them don't want no Negro with a PhD from Princeton talking about hip hop, elevating Tupac to a level of such rhetorical genius that I would give him equal magnitude as to a white philosophical thinker like Heidegger. So, so that's the Negro school, but the white folk let me do it. Having a guest like Michael Eric Dyson is really a unique opportunity for the audience, for the viewing audience, because here's a guy who you will see him be a talking head on CNN. You will see him chime in about what's going on. You'll, you'll know that he's written a book and he might go to a signing. But to be able to hear him talk about his life, about his personal journey, and to really get in there close one-on-one -on -one with people is really an amazing experience. And because we have been typically associated with doing musical artists. Right. And we really tried to spread our wings and really get people who really are involved in culture as a whole. And so people who might listen to Kindred the Family Soul might also read a Michael Eric Dyson book. And to understand that these people are the same people is a really important part of pushing culture forward. Michael Eric Dyson, thank you for stopping by Kindred Presents and sharing your gift, your story, your knowledge, your wisdom with our people. We really, really enjoyed it. And for me and AJ, we will forever be grateful to you for giving us that opportunity, brother. Angela, so when did your purpose become your passion? I don't know that TV is my purpose. One of the things I often ask myself is, am I going to make a difference? Is this going to be a constructive, positive difference in the lives of our folks? And if it's not, it's something that I don't want to do. Angela Rye was a great guest on she the was. show. She came on the show um, because she was uh, very well connected with Mark Lamont Hill, yes. who had also been a, uh, a, guest on the show, a guest on the show. And she came on the show and she was fantastic. She was on fire. She talked about so many things. The main thing for me is about not trying to fit a role as much as it's just like if I can just empower you, if I can just open a door for you that you can walk through that doesn't shut right after I walk through it. I take every day like that. Like what can I do to make a difference in that regard? The audience at that point had never probably seen Angela Rye in the flesh. They basically saw her on CNN and so many people love the way she has her really good comebacks and clapbacks. I am personally boycotting Tina for Mary Mary. If you go in on the roof and you say, I voted for Donald Trump because of his pussy grabbing Christian values, no. Now did she say well, that? No, I she said didn't that. She did say that I though. said that. That's I said not fair. that. You cannot be caught up in the okie doke. Like that, I, honestly, that ain't it. I just honestly. Well, you know their song yesterday? Yeah, that was the last time I listened to a Mary Mary album. To have her right there in front of them talking to them about her history and really giving them the feedback. She had a whole entire life in politics prior to ever being on television. I was fortunate to grow up in the house with people who ensured that making a difference was required. My dad named me after Angela Davis. And um, as far as I'm concerned, like if, if that's what I have to do, if I have to go out for the cause, I go out for the cause. But what I'm not gonna do is shrink in the face of the cause. You don't own me, you don't own my voice. You can own the oppression, but I'm not going to succumb to the oppression. Like, that's just not it. So if I, me speaking out is a threat to you, it just is what it is. I'm on the spectrum between Proverbs 31 and Tupac. So thug life, thug life. <laughs> so was Pac. Thug life. He just really had a way of interacting with people and getting them on fire. And I think that was one of the great parts about that night. But yes. we hit a little bit of a... Uh, Yes. Well, we asked her about her relationship, her relationship with, with Common. Common. Tell us how you met Brother Rashid, Mr. Common, and what's going on with you guys, because we're hearing a lot of stuff on the internet. That's where all of us get all of this information from. And so we just want to know if it's really this is, accurate. This is where we stop talking. Yeah. So this is really cute, because I thought I was going to be up here talking about, you know, black people and wokeness, what not my personal life. We are. Black people and wokeness. Not, my, not my personal life. She was like, Y'all all up in my business. Yeah, she really thought that she was coming to talk and speak to us, you know, really about activism and being an intellectual. Which we did talk way, about. Which we did. We, we covered all of those different things, but we felt like, I have personally felt like I had seen it on social media, which is where we all get all of our information from, and we all know it most times these days. And I had seen the pictures, I had seen them together and different things like that, but I guess it wasn't really 
widely known yet, even though I thought it was widely known. We kind of thought it was a little bit yeah. widely known. Um, <laughs> well, really, she just w wasn't really ready to talk about it. Yeah, she put it. us on the stop. What I will say is, um, Rashid... Well, you've been talking about this in, in the press. I have not been talking about this in the press. I thought it says that you... She really has, and I look for it. Pull up, pull up, pull up your source. Cite your source. It just made me feel real like, you know, I'm all about Because they like, why are you all in her business like that? She was like, hold up, y'all all in my business. But, but she didn't speak on it. A few months later, later. Here she is on the cover of Ebony Magazine. Who's on the cover of the love issue? With comment on the love issue. Why? Now, it's, it's okay for Ebony to talk about it. So excited, Angela. I do believe it was true. Thinking man emoji. Mm. <laughs> Sweet lady, you can hear lady, the lay your body. Let me rub the lonely. You know what I mean? No. Save that, Carl. <laughs> Save that. They get into I've never met Carl Thomas or seen him perform live. Ever. So that was a big treat for me, and I love him. I'm such a big fan of his. I wish I never met him. <laughs> well, let me tell you. It's a hell of a story. That girl that that song is about, man, she crashed and burned, boy, after that one. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Together, together, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, it was love and first sight. I know from the way she looks. Such a classic record, man. <laughs> Such a, a, a phenomenal voice. You know what I mean? And it's a non-traditional love song, in a sense, because he's talking about somebody that he guessed she was cheating because he wasn't cheating because he didn't But he said that was a time. real experience that right? he had. Mm -hmm. And but everybody loves that song. Those are the kinds of songs that really resonate with people when they can see that that's something that they could have gone through or yeah. that, you know, they've seen other people go through. And he's still sounding so good. He was singing. Tell us about meeting yeah. Puff for the first time. I remember the day that Big got off tour was actually a Sunday. And for some reason, he just decided to come to Chaz and Wilson's that night. And he brought Puff with him. When I got back to my table, uh, he had his assistant send over a note on a napkin and was like, yo, you know, that was fire, what you did, you know, I want to know if you could, you know, step step over here and, you know, have a conversation with me. Carl just was so real. He really was. He was, you know, you think about an R&B crooner and you think he's going to come on the show and be like, hey, ladies, you know, we want to talk to the ladies. Just all suited and booted and, suited you know, and booted. stuck up. And he, and he came and he was just so chill and so cool and so real. Halfway through the album, I, I just kind of like, really just kind of just made a decision to just let go, which is something that was always creatively hard for me to do. The more I got into it, the more I understood that it was important for me to just kind of listen to Puff's vision. Puff was not only a person that wanted to do things with my career, um, he was a person that had his fingers on the button to actually execute and do it. If you want to know how Puff became an artist, blame Biggie, okay? <laughs> Biggie was the one telling him, yo, man, they love that little dance you be doing, boy. You know, hey, <laughs> hey, you need to get on out there. You need to make, you know, something of your own and what have you. This and that Puff didn't, he, I, I don't even think he had the, I don't even think he had the mind to be an artist until Biggie actually encourage him to do that. The audience is used to seeing interviews of artists get on like a Tonight Show or something right. like that and they're all nervous and they want to say the right thing and they right. want to do the right thing. And it's a short interview usually, and it's very short. if they actually do get interviewed. Yes, and in our, in our interview it's much more relaxed and so the audience really gets a chance to see the artist just chill out, take off their, you know, they're this this moment here. Be long-winded if they relax. need to, to explain themselves. Because they do get long-winded. And complete <laughs> You know, and, and, and full, you know what I mean? Because sometimes you can't tell a story in two minutes. No. Sometimes you might need five or six minutes to really get the gist of everything that you're trying to say out. And we try our best to be um, as accommodating to these people as possible so that they can really elaborate on what it is that they more than likely have never told anyone. Welcome to the program. Man, I, I'm, I'm so honored to be here, and I really appreciate you all for bringing We had never met David Banner. I started off in Mississippi when they wasn't even playing um, rap on the radio. 
with Mantronics, T La Rock, Step okay. to Sonic. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? When when my friends were going through the no limit stage, I was going through the digging in the crate stage. Hip hop allowed me the opportunity to dream. Because it was so violent outside. A lot of people were afraid to, of Mississippi. So vicariously, they traveled through me. So after we actually, you know, reached out to his management and what have you, and we got, had him booked for the show and he was coming, we were a little concerned because, you know, a lot of times we need the guests to promote the show on social media because we're selling the tickets on social media and all of that. And for whatever reason, I don't know if it was just that, you know, David didn't really know us. It didn't seem like he was really doing that in that way. So when he came, it was already a little, Honestly, a little tension for me. And so when he got there, he just grabs the microphone before the show actually starts and starts talking to the people. And he's addressing the crowd before we really start the show. And I was uncomfortable with that. And so like, you know, I'm like trying to get him to, you know, get off the microphone and wait until we introduce him to the audience and what have you. And so we're backstage and it gets like to huff and puffs. But we're back and forth with one another like, yo, man, he's like, man, I wasn't trying to disrespect. And I'm like, yo, man, well, why are you do that? And da, da, da. And so, I mean, we calmed it on down and everybody like jumps in the way. I was painting my and... nails at the time and drinking tea. <laughs> Thankfully, we both calmed down. We were both professional. And, you know, the interview went off without a hitch. But it was, it was tense for a second. It was very tense behind the scenes. And people would probably be very surprised to know uh, how it really went down. Ladies and gentlemen, please make a lot of joyful noise for Philly's own hometown queen, Miss Jill Scott! Hey! Yay! Jill Scott, Jilly from Philly, the queen of Neil Soul to most people. Yeah. She's very instrumental in helping us to get our first record deal uh, and, and a huge part of the Philly fabric of music that everybody loves Jill. When we started Kendra Presents, of course she was high on the list of one of the guests that we wanted to get. And when we finally had a few shows under our belt, we felt like it was time to go ahead and reach out to Jill because we knew that people would because be excited to see Because I think in the beginning, her. we didn't want to just go straight and say, oh, let's call Jill. Just like I think we really early. wanted to, yeah, to solidify ourselves as a show mm -hmm. and let people know that we weren't just going to call all our homies mm -hmm. and say, hey, come on the show. When you're creating, especially your albums, are you spent? Sometimes it depends on the environment. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If I got the right trees and... <laughs> Palm? Palm trees? Palm trees. Palm trees. Palm trees. California, Miami, Broccoli. Yeah. Apple yeah. trees. Yeah. Having Jill on the show was a really good moment for us because we were ready and she was really ready to talk. And up until that point, we did a little research on this. She hadn't really done a sit down live interview like that, an extensive one, really ever. She had done an interview with Oprah, but at the time she was talking about the project she was on. So I really was looking forward to doing this because I felt like she'd open up. She would open up. What is it about your music that allows you to, to put so much into it that, you know, people get so much from it? I still don't know. Sometimes it's the lyrics, they happen in the middle of the night, they happen in the tub, they happen on the toilet, they just happen. You know what I mean? And I, I, I've learned to just be obedient to that, like grab a pen, grab a, some kind of recording device and just get it because it, it's not a guarantee. You know, it's, it's a gift, not a given. I love having great musicians around me. I don't read music, so I explain to them, I give them the story, I tell them what it tastes like, I tell them what it looks like, I tell them I, I say a, kind of, a bunch of vulgar things to them if necessary. Whatever it takes to get them to play this song or to play this line, that is what keeps me creating because it's still fun. And if it's not, then I need to go somewhere and sit down and do something else. I think that the audience really, really was endeared to her even more so than they are from just hearing her music. Because you really get a chance to feel like you know Jill Scott just through hearing her music because she's so open and transparent and talks about so many things that people really feel like she's their homegirl. And she did nothing short of that again in this interview and opened up to everybody. I, I had the smallest dreams. I did not have big dreams. I never imagined traveling the world. I never really thought about theater until Ozzy Jones was like, you, you Ozzy. He was like, you should act. And I was like, okay. You know what I mean? I didn't, 
I didn't have any plans, I don't think. I just feel like my entire existence has is, is really been spirit moved. Mm -hmm. You know, if my spirit is good with it, then I'll stay for a while. And when it's not, then I roll. <laughs> love that she remixed um, Golden and did a version of that record rather than just doing the original version because it gave us something a little bit more special than you know people just knowing what they were going to hear but of course singing the classic song that everybody loves her number one hit Golden on the program was yeah was really it's very super jazz she like went at it and, and interpreted it in a way that you know people who came got the opportunity to see that you know in that space Well, the crowd got a, a major treat, and for us, it's, it's so gratifying to be able to give them an opportunity to spend this kind of intimate moment with an artist who they love, because typically it just doesn't happen like that. For us, it was just amazing to see her connect with her audience and to see the people really, really appreciate her coming and sing the songs and be exposed to the new music and just really get a one-of-a-kind We are huge fans of you guys. We've watched you guys for a long time. We follow you, we cheer you on, we root for you, and that's not no yes. fluff, that's real. Woo, now I cannot even believe that we did all that. That was amazing. It really is like having a party at our house and inviting the audience over, not just our friends, but the audience over to enjoy this intimate space of us on the couch with our friends, just having a regular conversation, and we are inviting the audience into that. And I think people really genuinely feel some sort of um, kinship and connection to not only those artists, but ourselves, and feel like they are a part of that conversation, feel like they are a part of that friendship, and all of those things, and that is what makes it really, really special. So many great guests, so many great quotables, so many moments, it was really, a fantastic year. Our program is about black culture and black artists, and we definitely want to celebrate that. So there's a whole gamut of that, old school, new school, and you know, whatever is in between that. And we want to showcase all of that. And so we are reaching out to people, as well as, you know, affluent black people who are in culture, maybe artists, you know, actors, actresses, you know, politicians, intellectuals like Michael Eric Dyson and Mark Lamont Hill, all of these, Angela Rye, these kinds of people, because they have something valuable to offer our audience, and it all connects back to culture, black culture, black excellence, black beautiful people doing beautiful things in our world, and so that's what it's really all about. What a great year, so many fantastic guests, so many great moments so many memorable times. I, I had a wonderful time doing that. High five. Kendra presents. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs>